This video will cover the transport across membrane section of National 5, and um, it's the second part of Unit 1. So we're going to first of all talk about the cell membrane, because the cell membrane is the um, structure that controls the entry and exit of materials. So that was covered in the structure part of the first part of Unit 1. So this cell membrane, there's a diagram just below here. This shows the different parts of the cell membrane. So this part with the little circle and the two little bits coming off of it, these are called phospholipids. So these phospholipids allow the membrane to be fluid. So what that means is if you kind of poke it at the, at the cell membrane, then it'll move. Okay, so it allows it to be flexible. Now this part here is a protein. And also so is this part here. Now this is actually a 3D structure, so it's actually a sphere, but with a hole in the middle. And this hole in the middle is called a pore. Now the proteins have pores in them that allows the structures or substances sorry, to move through that cell membrane. Okay, so it allows things like um, glucose or salts or things like that to either move into the cell or to move out of the cell through those pores. Okay, so the proteins in a cell membrane allow that cell membrane to be selectively permeable. Now what that means is that a cell can be choosy or picky about what it allows in and out. So it can then decide whether it's going to let something in or out, not actively, not consciously like we do, but based on its size it can allow things in and out. Okay, so for example then, um, to explain what I mean by that, you can have molecules of starch that are really large Okay, and because those molecules are too large to pass through, then they don't enter the cell. And when I mean, when I say too large to pass through, I mean through the pores in that protein. Okay, so for example, in starch, be really large, it wouldn't fit through that hole. Okay, but other things like glucose, for example, glucose is small and therefore would be able to pass through. Okay, so that would be your glucose here. And this would be your starch. Okay, that cell membrane is selectively permeable and therefore it wouldn't allow the starch molecule through that pore in the protein, but it would allow the glucose through because the glucose is small enough. Okay, so when I mean selectively permeable, and I'm talking about selectively permeable, it means that that cell is picky, it's choosy, but what it lets across that membrane. Okay, so what you need to know now are the two different types of transport. So first of all you have passive and then you have active. So passive um, transport, well, well there's two different examples which I'm going to um, go into in a bit. But passive transport will move molecules along a concentration gradient. And what I mean by that is down the hill, okay. So down the hill from high to low concentration. So that's why we've got here, moving the molecules from high to low concentration. Okay, active is the opposite. Okay, so if passive moves along or down a concentration gradient, okay, so down the hill, active then would move it against that concentration gradient. So would move substances up the hill. Okay, so like this. Right, and because that act of transport is moving it up that hill, it's moving from an area of low concentration to an area of high. So that would be low to high. Okay, so if you think about a ball rolling down a hill or a car rolling down a hill, if it's starting to roll, it doesn't need to continue to then be pushed down that hill. Okay, there's no force involved in moving that from high to low concentration. Okay, so therefore there's no energy required for that. Whereas active you're going up that hill. If you're putting things against a concentration gradient, you're going to have to force it against that. So yes, that does require energy. Okay, so I've got an um, area in this table for additional information. That's just to give you some examples. So passive transport, we have examples of diffusion. And we also have osmosis. Now you're going to need to know what these two are and how they are different in a wee minute. 
And additionally, what I've got here for active transport um, is that you need to know that the proteins in the membrane. So just like I was talking about earlier up here, okay, these proteins in the membrane will allow mo molecules to be pulled against that concentration gradient. Okay, so proteins in the membrane pull molecules against the concentration gradient. Okay, so they're responsible for forcing those molecules across that membrane. Okay, so I've got on the right hand side here is um, the details or the beginning of the details of diffusion. So diffusion is a type of passive transport, okay, which is what we've got here. So therefore it doesn't require any energy and it moves molecules from an area of high concentration to low along a concentration gradient. Okay, so for your definition of diffusion, it's very, um, very similar to the definition of osmosis that we're going to cover in a minute. So it's the movement of molecules. Okay, now I'm being very general right now because this is quite general. Okay, so it's the movement of molecules from an area of high concentration Okay, so we always begin high because this is a type of passive transport and then to an area of lower concentration. Okay, so like I said, passive transport, we're going from high to low. Now you would need to know some examples of substances that move by diffusion. So that would be things like oxygen, okay, which are written there as O2, carbon dioxide, which are written as CO2, then you've got things like sugar, particularly glucose, you've got amino acids, um, things like salt. Yeah, there's plenty of other examples, but they're just a few. So anytime you talk about diffusion, they'd be naming substances, okay, like these ones. Now I've got here is just a quick diagram of an animal cell. So you need to, be able to explain the importance of diffusion to an animal cell. So for this animal cell, diffusion allows molecules to move in. Okay, so if you're in, like, in your animal cells, you would then pull in things like oxygen okay, and glucose. And that would move by diffusion into your cells. So it allows animals or animal cells to gain oxygen and gain glucose. It also allows them to get rid of certain things. Okay, so it allows them to get rid of carbon dioxide and also other wastes. Okay, now the reason this works this way is because you've got a high concentration of oxygen out here and a low concentration here. And the oxygen is going to move from the outside of the cell in. The same with this glucose. There's a high concentration of glucose here, but a lower one here. Okay, so the glucose moves into the cell. Now it's the opposite for um, carbon dioxide because there's a higher concentration inside of the cell and it moves to a lower concentration out. And that's the same for the waste. It's higher in, but lower out. So the molecules of that waste move out. Okay, now you can have some other examples for things like plant cells. Those would be in your um, notes on Google Classroom. So I'm going to move on and I'm going to show you osmosis now. Okay, so osmosis is very similar to diffusion. Although there's one real key difference. So just the same way as we started with the definition of diffusion, we have the movement of, but now specifically osmosis talks about water molecules. Okay, so your definition is very similar, except specifically this time now we're talking about movement of water molecules. Okay, so if you think about the diffusion um, definition, okay, I'll bring it back. It's the movement of molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low. For osmosis, it's exactly the same. It's the movement of water molecules, though, okay, from an area of high concentration, okay, but specifically now water concentration, so a high water concentration, okay, to an area of lower 
water concentration. Okay, instill that as across the cell membrane, so they're still moving molecules across the cell membrane, but this time more specifically it's water molecules instead. Okay, so below here what I've got are some diagrams, and I'm going to start with the animal cell. So this is an animal cell placed in a very, um, just a, a solution around about it, okay? So if you think about an animal cell or any type of cell, it's going to have stuff in it. Okay, salt, sugars, other things like that, and also some water. Okay, now this cell has not changed at all because there's been no overall movement in water. Okay, so what that means is there's no change in that cell. Okay, because there's no difference in the concentrations of water around it. Or inside of it. Okay, so when there's no difference in water concentration inside and out, there's no change in that cell. And that's exactly the same over here in this plant cell. Now if I place this animal cell into what's called distilled water, what that means is it's pure water. So 100% water. Right? So if I place that cell into distilled water, <clears throat> what's going to happen is, I'm just going to roughly draw it now, there's going to be a higher concentration of water outside, okay, because there's 100% water inside, or outside, sorry, but there's going to be less than that inside, okay, because the cell is made up of more than just water. So there's going to be a higher concentration of water here and a lower concentration inside the cell. Now if we look back at this, water moves from an area of high concentration to low. So that water would move into that cell and it would gain water. Okay, so that cell would gain water. And ultimately what would then happen is that cell would burst. Okay, so just to show you a wee doodle. the cell would burst. Now the reason that cell burst and it doesn't just swell is because it doesn't have a cell wall around about it, okay? Like this plant cell does. Okay, so the reason why it bursts is because there's no cell wall to prevent that from happening. Okay, so in this cell, the next one, we're going to place it in a strong salt solution, or a strong solution of any kind, whether that's sugar or salt. Now what that means is that, so that strong solution is going to have a lower water concentration than the cell does inside, okay? So that cell has a higher water concentration than the surrounding solution. And that's strong solution has a lower water concentration. So what's going to happen is the water is going to move from the inside to the outside, okay, because water always goes from a high to a low concentration. So if this cell loses water, okay, due to osmosis, then what's going to happen is it's going to shrink, okay, so think of this like a water balloon. If you fill it up with water, eventually it'll burst, okay, but if you take water out of it, it will shrink. So that animal cell then would shrink. Right. So if we do the same idea in a plant cell, again at this point there's no change in that cell, okay, because there's no difference in the water concentration. Okay, so the same idea as this. So no difference in the water concentration. Now if we place this plant cell into, again, pure water, so distilled water, again that cell is going to gain water. Okay, so if we just do the rough diagram to show you.
If that cell has been placed into a solution of 100% water, the highest concentration is outside that cell, and the lowest concentration then is inside. So what happens is that cell gains water, just like the animal cell would, and it swells. So when that plant cell swells, it still has a cell wall, but it looks swollen. So it's gained water, and ultimately then, if this is a piece of potato, for example, it would gain weight, and that cell's got larger. Okay, now because that cell has gotten larger, it's not just, we can't just say that it's um, swollen. Okay, it's got a specific term when we talk about plant cells. And that term is, pla um, sorry, not plasmized, that term is turgid. Okay, so that is gained water due to osmosis. Now, the next one, if we do the same idea, a rather strong solution. Which is going to have a higher concentration of water inside the cell. Again, just a quick doodle to show you. We've got a higher water concentration inside the cell now and a lower concentration out. So that water would leave the cell and therefore it loses water. and it shrinks. So this time what you'll see is then the cell changes. And it looks roughly the same in terms of the exterior as the initial cell did. Okay, so you still get your cell wall. But because it's lost water, the cell membrane starts to pull in. Okay, so the cell is still attached at points to that cell wall, but the cell membrane has pulled in. Okay, and that cell is described then as plasmalized. Right, so when you describe these and you ask to explain what happens to this cell, okay, so for example, pick the plasmalized one here, you'll be asked to explain the changes in that cell. So you have to state that water has moved. Okay, so you always have to mention water. And then state where the concentrations are and what they are. So water has moved from an area of the higher concentration within sites, so an area of high water concentration. And that concentration was inside the cell. Okay, so it began with a high concentration inside the cell. It's then moving outside that cell, so up here, you see that, okay? So to a lower water concentration. And that lower concentration was outside the cell. So when you explain these changes, what you have to state is the water concentration, you have to state the fact that it's higher or lower, and you have to state where they're higher or lower, inside or outside. Okay, so that's covered all of osmosis, and it's also covered previously that diffusion and um, the act of transport comparison between that and passive. Okay, so these two sheets were then what you need to know for your um, transport across membranes, subtopic for unit 1.